Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my The Last of Us Episode 2 breakdown, recap, and review. Hopefully this time, if you're wondering what happened to last week's episode breakdown, it got blocked. And then I had to re-upload it, and then the video completely tanked. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. If you happen to be watching this right now, and for some reason it's disappeared, but you're still somehow loading the video because you were on the page at the time of its blockage, you know why. It will be back up if, if you wanted to leave a comment. I don't know, I'm just putting this here just in case. Never had this many issues before. This was a very decent episode. Many, many, many similarities, of course, just like the first episode. And some changes of which, once again, having played the game myself, and I'm sure like many of you, I can somewhat understand, especially if you watch the behind the scenes of the episode, you kind of see the explanations for why they chose to do what they did. Uh, sometimes, you know, it might be about the fluency of the pacing. Maybe it's about building up the suspense and the fear in the episode and kind of making the stakes a little bit more tense of that of the format of a TV show versus uh, a video game, for example. So let's get into the events of this episode. And uh, yeah, I would love for you guys to get engaged down in the comments below and let me know what your favorite moment was. Because obviously there was that moment at the end, which if you're brand new to this series, of course, and you don't know anything about The Last of Us and you haven't played the PlayStation game, uh, that might have been a bit shocking to you. So first up, of course, we need to talk about how uh, each episode at the minute, and granted it's only been two, it kind of teases us the prelude to the outbreak and I really enjoy that because we see Jakarta in 2003 and it's just interesting seeing the world kind of cotton on to this. This also picks up from the radio report in episode one when they were in the kitchen. It's like, oh, some, <laughs> some stuff is going down there, some strange things. And of course, that is the cordyceps infection already breaking out. And we see that a professor of mycology has been taken by the police to look at some human samples of the cordyceps infection. That's the thing, she's like, well, it can't, it can't infect people, that there's just no way. And then lo and behold, as soon as she verifies that and she takes the tendrils out the mouth, that's that's something else. And my God, talking about tendrils, uh, you know, that reminds me of the ending kiss scene, Jesus. They didn't expect that kind of uh, mushroom intimacy, if, if you know what I mean. I, I don't know how else to phrase that. It's, it's just a very innovative way of showing the cordyceps infection in this series. I know some people don't like the lack of spores or whatever, even though we have had it teased recently that we might see it in the future. It just It's not kind of like the game, hence the lack of gas masks. They even said in the behind the scenes of this episode, again, I recommend staying to the behind the scenes of that for a little bit more expansion and context to things that you might be asking questions to. They said that like spores don't really congregate just in a room. The way they might work realistically versus that of what you can maybe get away with in a video game is they would float about everywhere. So it would be very hard to not get infected if there was a massive cordyceps infection worldwide because spores wouldn't just localize. You would essentially be walking around the corner and then you'd be like <gasps> and then you'd be done. We will see spores in other ways, such as we had a foreshadowing comment from Ellie when talking about various different infected, you know, shooting out massive fungi spores and whatnot. That that will most likely be coming. But yeah, going back to this flashback, when we had the policeman talking to Professor Iberantna and she was just like, bomb the city, burn it all, burn it all, going a bit Daenerys dead, no, but really, I really like this because it shows the gravity of that doctor, you know, or should I say a professor, is just like, the only way to sort this out, there is no cure, no vaccine, bomb the cities. She wants to go back to her family. She knows she's going to be bombed with them because that is how desperate this is. The world is screwed. There is somebody out there who infected these 14 other people and it's going to spread. But this also elevates the, the absolute crucial importance of Ellie, the character of Ellie. And that is a theme obviously in this series in of itself, but that plays quite throughout this episode because you had that big skepticism from Tess and Joel, mainly Joel, but definitely Tess in the first episode, and, and certainly when they're talking to her as she wakes up, it's like they've been watching her all night because they don't really trust the fact that her bite has lasted for three weeks or whatever. It's such an unusual thing to see because people don't last a day, so to speak. So they are very on edge. And once again, Ellie is a very important character. And the, the growing theme in this episode is somebody, you know, like Joel is is the shell of a man of what we saw 20 years ago. So is, so is Tess. Pretty much 
everyone, not everyone, but people like Joel and Tess more than most people and, and the, the crap that they've done, as Tess later said, have made them not the most ethical people. But in this episode, when you see Tess, it seems that something within her, as they went into in the behind the scenes, has been awoken. Something that was always there, but that just, just hasn't really been recognized for a long, long time. But as she starts to believe Ellie more and more, it's just like, oh, wait. And she somewhat right at the end of this episode, I guess you could argue awakens that in Joel only by like 1%. Or you could argue that he's only doing what he did at the end of the episode, taking Ellie out because she asked him to. And he's going to have that awakening himself on top of the fact that they will get that bond throughout the journey that's going to unfold, of course. But, you know, just believing it more and more because especially Joel, even more so than Tess and Joel's history with his brother, Tommy, who also joined the Fireflies. We've had reference to that in episode one. He's just like, I've heard this before, the miracle cures and everything like that. He He's not so subscribed to something like this. But the fact is, is that Ellie has survived and, and you see how quick how quick Tess's bite at the end accelerated that infection and and I almost forgot Ellie got infected in this episode as well uh, again I, I suppose you could say a little scratchy bite and it, it was just still a little scratchy bite whereas Tess just had this this massive fungal growth already happening but before we get into the very dark and dreary stuff at the end of this episode I loved being out there in the world as we are in this early part of the game as well but it, it truly mimicked it I don't think I need to keep repeating this just always assume <laughs> that when I'm comparing video game scenery to what we see here it is more or less a spitting image they are incredibly faithful it's, it's almost identical to the level design from even when we have the hotel bit which I'm sure reminded loads of people of just dragging Ellie across on a pallet for when she was saying that oh I can't swim which I, I think we might get a scene like that eventually uh, again at some point maybe in the series as a bit more of a on the nose scene the way the skyscrapers look in the daytime compared to where we saw it flashing at the end of the first episode even though again the similarities versus the differences we didn't have them escaping the Fedra troopers and then that's actually when they encounter the clickers in the video game but in this one they're more or less kind of navigating through the, the city seeing how Boston was bombed because they tried to contain the infection in the cities and it worked in some more than others and obviously that's kind of a reference to the professor at the beginning advising them to bomb the city that they were in so it would have been awesome I really do think it would have been awesome to see them go in the skyscrapers as we saw them in the video game uh, come across not only the infected but you know actually other humans but I feel like what I can understand here is when you translate it to TV, the fluency of this episode, seeing Tess and Joel and Ellie navigate their way throughout the city, eventually coming across a few obstacles, of course, and then making their way up at the museum, it builds up to the fear of what the clicker is. Now, I'm not saying you didn't feel that fear in the video game, in where you're kind of navigating through the skyscrapers and whatnot, but... It's, it's a lot more curated here and a lot more of a boss battle, you could say, rather than what you do and what you come up against in the video game version. Again, I, I hope nobody thinks I'm flacking against the freaking video game there because when you encounter those clickers, it can be pretty damn ruthless. Uh, but I just feel like confining it to like one or two that we had uh, in the museum and whatnot, it's like, oh damn. Like there's, there is so much more tension. And it's just interesting. I think everyone knows if you've played the game where this was going. I mean, as even, I guess you could say, maybe I'm reading too into this, but this was 100% deliberate, like a foreshadowing of when they first left that room of when they were camping. As the door opened, you heard that <laughs> of it like open, the little clicker noise, which obviously is foreshadowing, oh, you're going to run into clickers. But if you're a complete newbie watching this, you just think, that's, yeah, that's a door opening. But if you, if you now think about it, if you are a new viewer, that noise matches the very ugly mushroom face clickers that you see at the end of the episode because they make that clicking noise because they locate, they, they can't see, they can hear, they locate with echolocation, which kind of makes them even more terrifying. Now, as for Bella Ramsey and just everyone's performances this episode, I still really, really love them. Uh, I, it's interesting because I saw quite a few people echo what I thought of uh, Bella Ramsey playing Ellie, but then there's a lot more people being like, no, just no, can't get past even, not let alone Bella Ramsey, but also Pedro Pascal, just can't do it. But fair enough, right? You know, that that's your opinion. But I think they are most certainly actors who 
do pull off the performance of the characters. And we're in very early days now. I think maybe people who are a bit skeptical, uh, or maybe people who have written it off, I think that's way too early. I think maybe your opinion might be a bit more malleable, potentially, as you get throughout the episodes and you see the bond forged. And you'll see that, like, at the end of the day, these are two iterations of the same story. And that's kind of what Troy Baker said. And it is true. The Last of Us game, The Last of Us HBO live action, they are both retellings of the same story. And I, I look at Pedro Pascal as Joel, Ellie, the, the way her attitude is in, in this episode, because we get a lot more of it, right? You know, there's even a couple of scenes where Tess goes off to navigate a different way around. We have Ellie asking Joel questions, and, you know, he's just he's just completely a closed book at this point, but obviously, slowly along the way, that's going to change. Even later on in the episode, when we get that very mirrored scene from the video games, where they're talking about, is it everything you hoped it would be? And Ellie's just like, the jury's still out on that. When he's looking at her going down the ladder he looks down at his watch after just looking at ellie and it reminds him of his daughter like all of these things even if you have got it absolutely engraved and branded in your head that i can't see past these actors to what i i know troy baker is like in the video game i think you need to give credit so it's still what is being accomplished here and i would like to think and hope that maybe you can see other actors and maybe these castings blend into these roles. Personally, for me, I do, and I'm glad that so many people do as well, and I'm not trying to force people to be, like, coming over to this and be like, oh, yeah, they're great as well. Um, I just, I just would say give it a bit more of a chance for the essence of that story and these actors to breathe life into these characters as well, the way that you know them to be. Other things, like as they're looking at the infected, they're, they're almost so much more creepy and certainly more formidable here. Like I have al I've always thought that The Last of Us infected were, again, to make a comparison to Walking Dead here, more formidable and intimidating than Walking Dead zombies. Walking Dead zombies, you can smush their heads with your hands if you wanted to. You could like walk away at a slightly faster than slow pace and you would kind of get away. But in The Last of Us, they were still fast and, you know, there's different versions of them. You know, there's clickers and there's certainly larger and more scary beasts in The Last of Us world in the video game. But in the show, they've gone above and beyond that. So they've done all of that still. They're still fast. There's still different versions, clickers, normal infected, and the larger kind of scary ones that you've still yet to see. But they've also made this spore network, like mycelium, as as Tess said, which is based on literal real science, which is kind of what makes the cordyceps infection pretty scary because fungus grows underground and there's these long fiber-like wires that if you step onto a certain patch, as we see Joel shoot that infected later, that patch of cordyceps, which is connected through this fungal network of mycelium-esque, electronic-esque wires, can contact other aspects of fungal patches where a lot of infected might be hanging out and it's just a whole network and it's as simple as that and it's as believable as that as well with a world that's been taken over by it when you have like a whole hub of like blobby kind of cordyceps you know sprayed out on the wall sometimes it's like bony ash kind of like old dead rotted version of it but when it's active and there's like a little cesspool of it and there's little hubs like that located in places well then you're just gonna summon a freaking horde your way if you step on the wrong thing or activate the wrong thing you see those little little kind of uh, mycelium-y fungal tendrils pop out and then you know you're screwed. So that in my opinion does definitely land into the checkbox of innovation. I don't think that deviates because this game's infection system has always been based on cordyceps and fungal aspects. So what they've done with the live action show is actually, I would say, you know, in my opinion, improve it in certain aspects and innovate, not deviate. Deviate would be completely changing it. For example, let's say they made the show, didn't make it fungal based at all, very similar to Walking Dead, didn't have clickers, that would be deviation. So I like what they've kind of done here. So yeah, this is when we get into the museum and they're pretty sketched out. When they hear the clicker, the atmosphere completely changes. And I thought this was really well done really well shot as well the thing is was was joel like 1v1ing a clicker with his fists did he did he have like a a, a little shiv i don't know uh because i know he does have a blade but like i don't know if he was using one but i was just like are you really 1v1ing him i guess we had tess also distracting kind of 1v1 as well she obviously got infected at this part that's a very similar situation as in the game you don't kind of see 
it actually happened. But amongst all of that struggle with the clickers, she unfortunately gets bit. Funnily enough, so does Ellie. And we even have Joel saying, maybe the first bite didn't take, but the second, and we, we obviously have Tess just really having this newly awakened faith. Uh, she knows she's bit at this point. This is why there's a lot more adamancy with what she's doing. She kind of has a bit of a larger purpose that was already brewing before she was bit. She's starting to believe this whole thing with Ellie in of itself. And it's a kind of something that hasn't come out of Tess in a very, very long time. But now that she's dying, she definitely wants to cement more so than ever the road to Ellie's I guess, recovery and, and prospects of hope for humanity in the future. I'm not saying she's like gone all like holy conquest, we need to make sure we do this, but she's definitely got a bit more of a drive. Something that Joel probably remotely couldn't understand in this moment, other than when she says it right to his face at the end. Of which he is, as we went over earlier, only abiding by because it's quite literally her dying words, but that will become a lot more personal for him because he will actually bond with Ellie. And the end of the episode, I get it. I get why they changed it with regards to the way they decided to take Tess out, the way that she acted here. It's funny because there's quite a few changes and, you know, the dialogue is largely the same as well. For example, in the game, the Federal Troopers are once again closing in and Tess basically, ha having been in a similar situation, being bit, is going to try and distract them whilst Joel and Ellie can carry on. But in this version, it's actually something else. Joel shoots that awoken infected dude on the floor that basically sparks a beacon for other infected to come to the old state building. But the urgency and adamancy in Tess at this moment when all the fireflies who were going to take Ellie are dead on the floor and again happened in a very similar situation to the game. One of them got infected. The healthy ones fought the sick ones. And as Joel said, everyone lost. But Tess just wants to make sure that before she turns, she knows where to take Ellie. Anna Torv, who plays Tess in the behind the scenes, even says, if they do this one thing that can potentially save everyone, she can in one way be redeemed for all the crappy things that she's done. And that goes back to the, that line of when she was saying to Joel in this moment, all the shit that we did, Joel, this, saving this girl and, and doing something with it could actually mean something and I don't think it is or they're thinking it's got to wipe away all our sins but hey maybe there is something good that can come from this and you know the whole save who you can save line right before he darts away. I thought this was still a very emotional scene. I can still imagine some people would be like oh but why did they change it? Why didn't they have Fedra guards you know chased him throughout the skyscrapers and now into the old state building and Tess going out that way. But again this to me th these aren't huge plot deviations. It's not massively important to the plot that it had to be Fedra troopers is actually just if not more interesting that they executed it in this way. Changes to a plot are problematic when it actually alters the original plot in a very significant way. And no matter what way I look at this situation, this part of the adaptation can be open to, you know, it, it was still largely accurate, you know, Ellie saying, Damn, you know, she's infected. And then Tess showing the infection, like it's all very similar, yet I just hope people don't kick up a massive fuss about some of these changes because it doesn't ripple out in any negative way. If anything, it just still builds up the formidable threat of the infected, the severity of you know, how anything can change at any second. Like Tess, who's been with Joel for a long time now, uh, dead, gone. Ellie witnessed this. The importance of Ellie as well, the wound comparison. I felt very bad for Tess, even though I knew it was coming. Some of the dialogue, like, I never asked you to feel how I felt. That one was, uh it's like, damn, you know, it's... She obviously felt for Joel, but like that, you know, that wasn't really reciprocated. Nor, nor did she ever expect it to happen or for him to feel that way. Uh, and if there's one thing that she can do for him is to save Ellie, get her to where she needs to go, make it right. This is his chance to get her out of there and keep her alive. I'm not going to lie. I don't know why Tess was doing the lighter uh, because there was a bunch of grenades on the floor that were fueling, obviously, the explosion to come. Uh, I would have just picked up the grenade and had the pin ready. Yes, she, her, her hand was twitching and stuff, but it's easier to pull a pin of a grenade. And she knew she was going to die anyway. So yeah, maybe this will be a bit of a nitpicky debate. But I'm just saying, why would you try and rely on that? Have a tendril kiss with a freaking infected and then like, that you still might not have been able to spark it. Uh, you know you're going to explode anyway, so you may as well pick up the grenade and explode with that. I mean, that, that would have been my preference. But still, not trying to take away from the gravity of this moment. That was the end of episode two. 
And uh, I know that was quite a bit of a rambly, rambly episode discussion, but hey, uh, that's the way I like to do it. I like to ramble about this, and I'm having a great time doing so, because I'm having a great time watching this show. So let me know what you thought of this. What, what do you think, first and foremost, as both uh, maybe a new fan? Let me know your takes there. But if you've played the events of the games, what do you think of the way it's being adapted? Have you warmed to it anymore if you're a bit skeptical on the castings in the first episode? Because I know there was quite a few of you in the comments of episode one who are feeling that way. If you weren't feeling that way, just let me know what you think of the adaptation changes in general. But that is absolutely everything, guys. So if you want to help me out and, and, try and, and try and creep into that Last of Us algorithm here on YouTube, please like the video, maybe leave a comment, and also share it maybe on Twitter or somewhere like that. That would be very, very helpful. Um, of course, there are links in the description down below if you want to follow me a bit more. Check out some of my other videos for more news, reviews, breakdowns, updates, and all good things. And uh, I guess I'll see you in next week's The Last of Us episode, guys. So thank you again so much for watching. Really appreciate that. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.